David Trimner is with us today. Um, wave hello to David. He's general manager of Miltrim Farms in Athens, Wisconsin, which is in Marathon County. They are the largest automated dairy in Wisconsin and the only farm in all of North America to be AWS certified. And that's the Alliance for Water Stewardship. And that's done through Clearwater Farms program of uh, the Rivers Alliance. Uh, the program guides farms and processing facilities through a rigorous certification of their on-site and supply chain water management using the AWS International Water Stewardship Standard, uh, the world's only comprehensive industry water use standard. And as members of EPIX, uh, who Scott Berdeau uh, mentioned is uh, doing a presentation on Thursday, uh, they're members of the uh, EPIC, which is the Eau Plain Partnership for Integrated Conservation. Uh, they understand the relationship between healthy soil and healthy water, the very thing that we've learned. Um, David will discuss the farm's background, describe their operation, and share the approach to good soil and water stewardship. So with that introduction, uh, welcome, David. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it. I'm glad to be here with all you guys and uh, looking forward to kind of telling you a little bit about uh, what we do here at the farm. So let me share my screen here and we will get started. All righty. So first, I just kind of want to tell you guys a little bit about um, the farm and, and what that kind of looks like. So uh, again, we're Miltrum Farms over in Athens, Wisconsin, and we were established in 1988. And that was started by my dad, Scott Trimner, and my uncle, Scott, uh, Scott Tom Miller. Um, at that point, uh, uh, both my dad and my uncle had grown up on farms. And so conservation has kind of been a long held family practice. My grandpa, which would be Tom's dad, that'd be Martin Miller. He had won some awards for conservation um, he, he used to do uh, strip contouring and, and some kind of interesting things to, to uh, help mitigate and, uh, soil erosion and whatnot on his farm, uh, which actually is where I live now, at the home, home farm and in the home house. Um, at that time, uh, when they started in 88, we were milking about 40 cows. And throughout the years now, we've kind of grown, obviously, to the size we are now, which is milking about 2,800 and that's going to be about 1,700 in the parlor you see in the background, and then uh, 1,100 in our robot facility, uh, which will soon to be uh, 1,800, and so um, which is pretty exciting. And then along with that, obviously, uh, lots of acres to feed those cows, and so we're, we crop about 5,000 acres, and that's split between corn uh, and alfalfa grass mix for hay, and then a little bit of oats as well, just to throw in a kind of a mixture of things. So what got us started? So for us, you know, water is really important to our families. Um, I remember uh, as a kid, we would, we would go up to my uh, aunt and uncles in uh, Park Falls and we'd go on out on the lake in Phillips there and, and go tubing and whatnot. I know Tom is a big uh, fisherman. He really likes uh, fly fishing and whatnot. And so, you know, water is just really important. Uh, we all live here. Uh, we all drink the water from uh, the wells we have uh, in the country. And so we want to have good quality water. And, uh, you know, surface water is, a, is a definitely a big issue in Wisconsin, um, particularly with the phosphorus when it comes to surface water runoff. And so that's something that's, that's, that we don't want to uh, be a problem. We want to be a solution up, up for that issue. Um, for us, we have a lot of fields that are high risk for erosion. Um, for our, our soils are pretty heavy. And so with the slope, if, if they if they lay bare for too long, uh, you're going to have issues and you're going to have erosion. And, and that's, really, um, that's really one of the big reasons uh, for pollution is just the soil running off uh, and into uh, the streams and lakes. And then that just really causes a lot of problems. Um, another reason our, our watershed is kind of a big issue in our county, Marathon County, because we're one of the highest percentage of acres for corn silage. And more corn silage is a great crop in the sense that it provides a lot of good uh, nutritional feed for the cows. Um, it also leaves the soil up about as bare as it can be. And so you got to tackle that with uh, different practices and, and planting cover crops uh, within the corn to, to kind of help mitigate that. And again, I kind of talked, you know, our, we got heavy soils, particularly where we are. And uh, those heavy soils need to be protected. Um, you know, they don't, uh, w without proper management, uh, 
water does not infiltrate. It just hits the soil and breaks it up and, and washes it away. So just to talk a little bit more about our commitment to, to all this. So again, we were uh, the first farm that was uh, Clearwater Farm certified uh, in North America. And um, what that involved was a pretty long process for us because we were the first farm of kind of putting in, in documentation and, and planning and figuring out what, um, what are our practices, what are our goals and, and how do we get there? And so that's one thing, this, um, this certification, there's not a particular set bar that you start out as. Um, the, the purpose of it is to, sh is to strive to continually improve. Obviously there's a baseline yet, you know, you still need to be in compliance and be doing, um, you know, be doing right by the, by the land. But uh, um, even just us, for example, as we go through the presentation, you'll be able to see different pictures of cover crops just kind of off to the side, like the one you see here. And this one is, is an example of a, a tremendous field with great cover crops. And then some of the other pictures, they look pretty good, but um, we want to continue to improve, continue to get thicker and thicker cover crops to have more, more of a benefit, especially um, because we have to haul manure. And so we need the cover crops to sustain through that. And I'll kind of go through that a little bit as we, as we get into it. And then um, again, the, we get an audit every 18 months. Um, and this is a third party audit for this um, certification. So it's uh, very legitimate and uh, it's, it's something we take very seriously. And it, it just kind of helps us continue to push uh, changes and the goals that we have here on the farm. So let's kind of talk about the practices. Um, so again, w right now we're doing as much no-till and minimum till as possible. Uh, that's uh, very important for a variety of reasons. Uh, we, again, we like to utilize the cover crops to have growth year round. Um, by doing that, uh, cover crops and no-till are a good hand in hand kind of thing. Uh, we also incorporate water savings practices on the farm. Um, so obviously one big part of this is, is not just how do we handle surface water, but also how do we handle the groundwater that we have? Um, you know, we want to use it as wisely as possible and we want to make sure that every gallon is going uh, to the best use that it can be. Um, dairy farms obviously use quite a bit of water because you're, you're making a lot of milk and dairy cows drink uh, quite a few gallons of water every day. So uh, let's put that water to good use and, and uh, get the most out of it that we can. Um, another one of course is the responsible and productive manure use and handling. Uh, one thing I like to say that we've tried to transition into is, is no longer treating manure as a waste, but treating it as a fertilizer and treating it very importantly. And I think that's uh, a big deal. And then the last thing that we're kind of experimenting with and, and have been doing more and more of is removing unproductive land uh, to create buffers and plots. And I'll get into that a little later. So no-till, let's talk about that for a bit. So uh, basically, you know, what that involves is just not tilling the ground. Um, you know, the practices that we used to always do, we love to see, you know, black soil before we planted. And uh, that's really not something we need to do anymore. Uh, so when you, when you practice these no-till practices, what you're doing is basically allowing the soil to keep its structure. And so when you pull a plow through the ground, you're, you're damaging that soil. It's not something that's beneficial to it. Um, it, uh, it fractures that soil and now that soil does not have any, any structure. And because of that, um, it kind of, it, it'll, it doesn't uh, facilitate good, good uh, water permeability. Um, it, obviously the soil, because it's loose and in place, it can run off easier. Uh, some things that we've had to do, uh, it, it, you can see in the picture, it, it's called a, a no-till corn planter. And so there are, are, there are different types of equipment that you need to purchase in order to do some of these practices. Um, but for us, that was an investment that was, that was very, um, we were willing to make that. Um, and by doing that, uh, the planter does a great job of, of, of uh, planting into a, a no-till scenario. And then for the hay ground, we still do uh, some minimal tillage and we're kind of working our way out of that as well to do just uh, no-till um, in that application also. So some just kind of the little benefits that we do the no-till for is, is the fields are firmer. So again, because I talked about the, the structure, um, when you destroy that structure, you just, you just ba basically made a sponge. So the, the soil gets wet, it turns into a wet sponge and you drive on that and now it's just, it just muck out there. But whereas when you leave the soil alone and it has that structure, water can permeate through um, 
but it stays in place. And so by doing that, you can get your equipment out on the fields faster. And that's, that's a big deal. I mean, being able to plant corn on say May 5th versus May 10th, because uh, on May 5th, the, the soils would have been too wet uh, for you to get out there without doing damage. Uh, that's a big deal for us. Ask a question now, or you want to wait till the end? Um, if you'd like to, but otherwise, generally, uh, I'll 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 do it at the end as well. But okay, you, I'll, I'll just do it at the end because you might answer it. Then are here oh. in the next see in the next slide. Thank you. Okay, no, that's no problem. Yeah. So again, uh, cover crops and no-till definitely go hand in hand. Um, so one thing we we started the cover crops and no-till about six years ago. Uh, so it's definitely something we've been experimenting with before we got the certification. Um, so again, the certification is kind of a good. A driver for us to continue to, to improve on those practices. And so the first experimentation that we had with cover crops was actually a drilling ryegrass post silage harvest. Um, but obviously over time things change. And one thing that had changed for us is we'd switched to BMR corn silage because it was more, it was more um, digestible for the cow. And so because of that, we had to harvest later because it was just naturally a longer day corn. And so we didn't have that time frame to drill um, all of our corn or all of our, our cover crop in after it just would be too much and it'd get too late that that cover crop would fail. So what we did is we purchased what you see here is an air seeder. And so how it works is basically um, you fill it with seed and uh, uh, it, the seed runs through tubing and is um, kind of sprayed out in between the corn rows. And so by doing this, um, you can get that seed established in the early summer and get things growing pretty quickly. One thing that we've learned is that it's really important to, um, uh, to put this on early enough uh, uh, before the corn canopies uh, too quickly. So we, we used to um, try to put the cover crops on at about V4, which just means uh, there's four leaves on the corn plant. And so by doing it at that time, uh, if we got it in quick enough, um, it would be okay. But if, we were, if, if, if the growing season really turned good and, and the corn grew fast, uh, it would canopy and then that uh, cover crop would die because it would not be able to get established versus now we're putting it on uh, shortly after the corn is up. And by doing that, this gives the cover crop plenty of time to get established and get some good growth into it uh, still without hurting the corn because that's obviously important. You don't want to, you don't want to stunt your growth, um, but you get that in there. It gets a good establishment. And then by the time it's the corn's canopied, uh, you've got some good growth there. And then when you harvest, now you're, you, you know, you've got a good thick cover crop there that's going to continue to flourish uh, as the, as the, um, the last of the warmth of the year is it, it's, it's exposed to that and to that sunshine. So um, there's a lot of different varieties that we use and the varieties all kind of have a special purpose. And so um, some of the main ones, you know, you know I talked about uh, that cereal rye that we did at the end of the year. Um, one reason why we do that one is, is it's really good at alleviating compaction. And so when you do go into a field, uh, you know, let's look at 2019, for example. Uh, 2019 was a very wet year. And so there was plenty of areas, particularly headlands, that had some compaction because of the heavy equipment and the poor soil conditions. Well, rise in particular are really great at alleviating that. The root system goes very deep and it breaks through any hard pan that you put in its way. And so by doing that, um, we break up that compaction without having to use tillage, which is, is, was one of the big um, things, kind of the big challenges that we had to get around um, when we first started with cover crops. Um, I, again, nutrients sequestration is another one, as well as weed suppression and kind of a thick biomass. And so basically, you know, cover crops, they're great because they provide more plant matter and more, and more root structure to capture nutrients. So particularly after harvest in the fall, um, you chop the corn silage off. Now you've got all this green growing there that can uh, make use of that manure when you put it down. And then, uh, and then it uh, you know, stores that in the soil and stores that in the plant. So then for next year, it's available and, and usable and it stays in place. Um, again, we use an annual rye that's again for more compaction and then uh, also for some spring green. Uh, we also use a couple different types of clovers. And so the clovers are really nice because they fixate nitrogen, which is just basically taking nitrogen uh, out of the atmosphere and turning it into a usable form. And um, by doing that, you potentially can use less nitrogen in an application. 
Uh, it's not a tremendous amount, but anything counts. And uh, that's just some, uh, some savings on inputs that you have when you have uh, plants doing it for you. Um, again, the, the, those clovers, they provide a lot of biomass and they also are spring green. And then white clover actually handles wet spots really well. So if you've got kind of a lower area, um, the white clover flourishes in that spot. So you don't have uh, uh, just a bare spot there. A couple other uh, types of cover crops are uh, cowpeas. Um, again, they fixate nitrogen and are very tall and viney. Uh, so these pro provide a lot of uh, plant matter. Uh, hairy vetch as well, biomass. Um, it's a biannual, so it'll come up green. And then it fixate nitrogen. And then the last one is, is rapeseed. So one thing that's interesting about that is uh, if I go back here, rapeseed is the, is the very big leafy plants that you see in this photo here on the bottom. And so what's nice about those is that you, we plant those to help um, knock down insects because instead of feeding on the corn, the insects are going to uh, tackle that first because it's lower to the ground. They're gonna tackle that, feed off that, be satisfied, and now you don't have to worry about uh, potentially utilizing some um, insecticide to, to knock that down. Um, by all means, the rapeseed does not tackle every insect, but some of your more common ones um, it, it'll, it'll help mitigate that and keep that at bay to help protect the corn, which is just kind of a cool way um, to use nature to, to uh, protect your, the, the plants that you're trying to grow. So, so again, just kind of some of the benefits uh, to these, because obviously the, these, these, um, these practices are, are really great for the environment and they're great for the conservation, but you also want them to pay off for the farmer as well, because um, obviously farmers have to be profitable to maintain the farm. So one of the big things is removing the cost of multiple passes through a field. For us, uh, pulling a chisel plow through the field is an, ex is an expensive endeavor because you're using your largest tractor, uh, which has got a lot of horsepower, uh, uses a lot of fuel and just costs a lot to purchase. And so by removing that pass, um, you're saving quite a bit of money. Um, again, we talked about that soil structure. Uh, so by improving that soil structure through good root systems and through not breaking up that soil, you improve that water permeability as well as the holding capacity. And so uh, that's a beneficial because as uh, climate gets a little bit more and more um, varied and we get bigger rainfalls, uh, the soil will have more capacity to hold that water. And then if it, if it can't hold it all, the water that's going to you know, flow off is going to be clean because the soil will not be in that. Another thing is, it, is uh, it improves the soil microbiome. And so that's something that we've kind of been really learning more and more about um, over the past few years is that microbiome and what that looks like. Um, just like humans have a kind of a microbiome in their gut, soils also have a microbiome which helps break down uh, minerals and micronutrients. Uh, one thing that we learned recently uh, was that potentially as we, as we put potash on our soils to uh, to improve the potassium levels, um, we might potentially be, be uh, killing some of the microbes which help make potassium more available to the plants. So you might be trying to do one thing, uh, but then hurting yourself in another realm because uh, with, with potash, it's, it's very high in, I think it's chloride. Um, and so that's, it just, it hurts the, that microbiome and can potentially hurt you in the long run. Um, it also improves organic matter. Now that's obviously something that's going to take uh, many years and decades to start to see big changes, but uh, I'd rather see in slow, small, tiny improvements in, in organic matter than, than small and tiny um, losing of organic matter throughout the years. So uh, that's definitely worthwhile and it's, it's a big, big part of the cover crops. So, and then again, it creates that firmer field, uh, so it's easier to get into with equipment. And uh, one example I have is a few years ago, we, we um, had harvested a field. Uh, I want to say it was corn silage. And um, uh, right across the road was a, a neighbor who was also harvesting his corn silage. And we, we, we were done and they were still trying to harvest theirs. And it was just muddy and rutted and they were, you know, dragging tractors to the field. And we went in and, and uh, actually um, injected manure onto our field. And, um, when we did it, the soil is firm. Uh, the conditions were, were pretty darn good. So it was just the night and day difference showing um, what, uh, you know, mowboard plowing, con conventional tillage, what that can do 
uh, to the soil and the structure versus just leaving the soil alone and, and letting it do its thing. So that was, uh, that was an eye opener for us. So again, uh, another important part is uh, how we use the water on the farm. And so we're trying to utilize technologies to help lower our water use on farm. Um, one thing we do is we, we flush, um, in the robot farm, we flush all the alleys. And so we use good, um, we use good like manure cleaning technology, such as a centrifuge and rotary screens to help clean up that flush water. It's basically a brown water or a gray water. So it's not, it's not, you're not throwing in clean water into this. You're just reusing what you have, that manure water and, uh, uh, making a better flush out of it through these technologies. Another thing that um, we're utilizing is, is really good ventilation. In the robot barn in particular, we, um, we've realized that we won't have to put in any kind of water uh, for cow cooling because we invested a lot in ventilation and so it'll use a little more electricity, but we're gonna save on water, which uh, is important because the less water we use on farm, the less manure we have to haul out uh, uh, during the year. And that's really important. So by doing that, um, we keep the cows cool uh, and save on water. So it's kind of a win-win. Another thing we're trying to do, uh, particularly with our waters for the cows, is, is keep them shallow. So instead of filling them plump full, uh, we fill them to a shallow level enough for the cows to drink properly, but uh, not so much um, uh, that, that you're, you know, you're filling them all away the because obviously you want to have the cows to have clean waters. And so when you clean that, you're dumping that out. And so by keeping that water shallow, we are saving on water use um, th through that water that we're dumping out. And so that's just a simple thing that we've uh, tried to do to kind of help make a difference. And then the other thing that um, we, we've heard more about and have started to notice ourselves is, is with robots, you start to save water. Um, with big parlors, you got a lot of fire hoses rinsing down the parlor and uh, using a lot of water. And with the robots, because you're on a small scale, you, you can be more precise with how you use the water and thus you're, you're, you're using less of it. And so that's been a, a pretty cool to see. And um, I know other farms have seen that as well, especially farms that do a pure retrofit and take out their parlor and put in robots. Uh, they're, they're definitely seeing a difference. And then another thing that we utilized, um, we do have some sprinklers in our, our other facilities. And uh, we recently swapped out every nozzle in those sprinklers to just make them more efficient to, to be really highly efficient water nozzles. Um, and one thing that we try to do with that is to use only as much water as needed. Um, so it's really easy with sprinklers and, and uh, soakers to overuse on water. And so uh, we try to be pretty particular on using just enough water to get the cow wet um, without, you know, uh, using a bunch that just runs off and goes on the ground and, and using exactly what the cow needs to keep her cool. So obviously again, with, with cows, you have manure and uh, you know, manure can be a blessing or a curse depending on how you look at it. And so responsible manure handling is, is very important. Um, one thing uh, we did quite a while ago now is we switched from a tillage style manure shank to a, a low disturbance injection bar. So basically all that, that injection bar that you see there is doing is just making a slit for the manure to go into and then kind of covering it back up again. And we've actually used this piece of equipment on like an old growing hay crop stand and had good success with it. Um, another thing we do is we utilize a drag hose uh, right from either the manure pits themselves or, or from trucks uh, to a, a, what's called a frack tank, basically a big dumpster. And by doing this, we help keep a lot of excess weight off of one off of the roads, but also off of the fields. Um, and that helps with compaction and helps with keeping the soil uh, healthy and the plant and the plant matter there as best as possible. Another tool that we um, are utilizing, and I tried to get a picture of this beforehand, but I couldn't, I couldn't get one for my, my crop guy is, is we are using a dribble bar on the hay ground. And so because we switched from an all alfalfa hay stand to a mixture with grasses, we're putting a kind of a low rate of manure onto that once a year after each cutting. So after say one cutting, we'll, we'll do about a third of the acres. And then after another cutting, we'll do another third. And we use this dribble bar because what it does basically is it places the manure right at the soil level, but it doesn't, it doesn't dig in at all. It doesn't, it just places it there through um, a bunch of hoses. And by doing it like that versus like a traditional top spreading, 
there's a lot less odor and you're not spraying the plants. Um, you're just getting it right to the soil. It, it uh, immediately in, infiltrates into the soil and the plant starts utilizing that manure as, it, as it's being broken down. And that's been really, really cool to see. Um, and then the other big thing is spreading at lower rates. Uh, for us on the farm, we shoot for about 7,000 gallons an acre in a non-corn ground. So in like that hay, hay ground that I talked about and 10,000 gallons an acre for corn ground. And so that's really important uh, to keep our rates low. And uh, thankfully we, we, we have plenty of land mass to do that, especially now oh, that- Oh, wait. What, what was that? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I think dog was freaking out. I didn't know my mic was unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Nope. No problem. Um, anyways. And so, uh, by, by spreading those lower rates, you're, uh, one, you're, you're helping that soil microbiome again. If you're spread really heavy manure rates, you're going to, you're going to do some damage there. And then also you're just, uh, very much mitigating the possibility of, uh, of, ha uh, having runoff and just having the manure and the nutrients leave the, uh, leave the, the field. So then the last thing that we have been working on is putting in buffer strips and then taking unproductive ground um, out of production. And so what we're doing is we're utilizing our field maps and our yield monitors uh, to kind of pick out the poor, either the poor areas or just the poor fields and, and kind of making a plan on how we tackle that. So with the buffer strips, um, we find a field, for example, we have a field um, that's, it was 62 acres and we took eight of those acres that was on, on the edge of the, the south edge of the field. We took those eight acres out of corn silage production because it was consistently poor, poor yielding, uh, money losing area. And so by taking that out and planting it into uh, perennial grasses and for, for hay, we can still harvest that uh, for heifers and whatnot. Um, but we'll get more out of it because the grasses are going to handle that poor soil better. And then the other perk of that is now you have a buffer strip in a low area so it can better capture any nutrient that may be leaving the field for whatever reason. Or if you have heavy rains, uh, the, that, that water is going to flow through that thick mat of grass first uh, before it can leave the field. So that's been really cool. And we, we, um, we saw some improvement on that 62 acre field this year. It was, it was $11 an acre more profitable by doing that than by not doing it. And the other cool thing is some of these are, are program sponsored. So even this one, um, you get a little bit of money per acre to help cover all that seed costs or, or, or um, uh, to cover the initial cost of uh, kind of getting yourself started, but you can still harvest it. Other, other um, options are uh, putting in, you know, putting your land in CRP or Monarch and honeybee pots. And we've actually done that as well. I think there's one 15 acre field particularly where we just took it out of production. It was not worth harvesting. Um, and so we put that into, uh, I think it was a Monarch, uh, Monarch plot. And those are generally more expensive to, to buy the seed and to plant them. And so it's nice to have different programs that are, are gonna incentivize you to, to do that. Um, and by doing that, we're um, uh, just making more habitat for the species that we need, um, the, the Monarchs and the honeybees. Uh, they're very important, obviously, to the local ecosystem, and so we want that to, to uh, be there. And then uh, another thing that we're trying to work on now is, uh, is to, to kind of create, um, create a, a well recharge uh, near the farm. So obviously, uh, with all the cows, the cows drink lots of water, and so we pull, pull plenty of water from the wells, and we want to um, kind of put in place uh, certain catch and base basins and catchments to help slow water down when you have a rain event because we have plenty of acres of roof and uh, and gravel here at the farm that all flow through uh, our, our stormwater pipes and then go out to uh, this field that's just be just west of the farm and so we want to be able to kind of slow that down and allow that to permeate the soil and help recharge the wells even more because um, we have enough enough you know acreage that we, we can more than recharge our whole year's water use in just the summer. And so obviously we get big recharges in spring and, uh, and some, and then fall, but we want to, you know, we want to be able to uh, use water all year round uh, to help recharge those wells and, and keep them full and, and uh, be able to have water for, for generations to come. So that's something else that we're kind of working on and we're pretty excited about. So. So just some, uh, you know, closing comments. Um, 
conservation, it brings a lot of added value to the dairy. Uh, you know, some things here, obviously it improves that soil health. That's really important to, I think having um, crops that are gonna be successful for years to come is, is having good soil health and good microbiome. Um, again, it, it better captures the manure nutrients. I mean, you can see in the picture, being able to have some green on there when you plant or when you uh, inject the manure is going um, to is going to help you know that the manure is going to be able to get captured and utilized right away, and that's pretty important. Um, again, it allows easier access to fields uh, because of the fact that the the, the fields are firmer. Uh, we can get in there quicker, and that's that's pretty pretty powerful and and makes for very uh, very um, important aspect of of all these practices. Uh, we, we don't see any yield loss from planting cover crops, which is also really important. Um, I know a lot of people would push back on these if, if you started to see yield losses in your crops, but that's not something we see. It's, it's more of like a companion crop, which is what, uh, uh, what some people like to call it. And so it works alongside uh, your main crop that you're trying to harvest and, and doesn't hinder it. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship. And again, we just want to promote productive soils and clean water for generations. Um, one thing I heard um, not too long ago is that at, at the current rate of soil loss that we have, we could have uh, almost nearly unproductive soils in 60 years. And that's only 60 more harvests that we can utilize to, to grow food on. And that's kind of a pretty scary thing. Um, I think we want to uh, start to reverse that trend and, and continue to build up our soils and, and uh, make them better and better and, and um, allow us to grow that extra food that we're gonna to need to grow for all the people uh, who are gonna be here in 60 years. So um, with that, uh, I would take any questions now that uh, anyone would have. Uh, this is Carson Heineke, I've got two questions for you. Uh, one is, do you have a high groundwater table in your area? Uh, yes, we do. Yeah, groundwater is very, uh, very close to the surface. Okay. The second thing is, other than manure, do you, do you utilize any other type of fertilizer? Yes, we still, um, we, we use um, uh, starter and some uh, nitrogen for, uh, for our corn. For our, so when we, when we plant corn, we'll put a little bit of two by two down, which is just nitrogen right next to the seed, as well as some starter. And then we'll, we will go back and do a second application of, of nitrogen, so. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, thanks so much for coming, David. You really explained that very well, and we really appreciate it. My question is this. Um, have you ever thought about doing composting teas or anything like that on your soil to improve the biomass? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, we, we were just, we just started thinking about that, like what would composting look like and how could we utilize that? So it's definitely something we actually, have an area pre-prepared that if we wanted to do something, we'd have it available and ready. So we're not entirely sure what that looks like, um, but we're definitely doing some research on that. So I know some farms have tried it and then tried to sell the product. Um, I don't know if that's, I know that's really hard to do, but uh, just to be able to maybe compost it and then yeah, have that as a soil additive, even on your far away soils, I think would be you know, potentially something that would be really beneficial. And the reason I bring that up is because I watched and I encourage you to watch this. There was a great documentary called The Biggest Little Farm. Have you heard about that one? No, I've not. Mm. It's really good. It's about a farm in California. So it's a different environment completely. But they used a, uh, a compost tea to re revitalize their soils and they did it within four years. Really? The where the biomass was unbelievable. So. Mm. Um, it was the, they, they were breaking ground on it. And the other question I have real quickly is, do you ever let your cows out to pasture feed at all or not? So uh, we cannot, uh, the DNR will not let us. But one thing we did do last year, which is pretty exciting for us because we can't personally, we have um, a neighbor who we rent most of his land from, but he has some of it yet for his, his grazing, uh, his grass fed beef. And so after we harvested the corn silage uh, on the land that we rent from him, uh, he let his beef out and pastured the uh, cover crop. So that's something I think we'll continue to try doing with him. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Dave, here comes a big question. <laughs> so how did the uh, use of the cover crops affect your profitability? Um, so 
That, no, that's a great question. Well, one of the big things, again, is um, not having to do multiple passes in the field. That's going to be a big, that's a big savings for us. Another thing um, is going to be, you know, kind of have, you know, better utilizing the manure nutrients um, and the manure credits that we get from that. So we have, we don't have to use quite as much for uh, synthetic fertilizer. That's a, a big, a big perk. And then I think the other big one that is really important again is the fact that we can harvest and plant easier because the cover crops provide, especially the cover crops, they provide a really good, like um, a very good kind of mat for equipment to drive on. And so even in, in wetter conditions, um, doing one pass over, over one area, that, that first pass, the cover crops really kind of hold up equipment nicely. So I, I think there's a, I actually, I know there's a ton of value in being able to do those things a bit earlier or a bit later, you know, timing of, for example, if, if your, uh, um, if your corn is ready to harvest and you can't get out there cause it's so wet or, or, or particularly planting, if you can, you know, plant your corn five or five or six days earlier, um, that could be a big difference in, in how it thrives for the rest of the year. That's a really good point that you bring up that, uh, cause you increase your soil health and the structure of the soil by having those cover crops and roots act as that kind of a mesh to mm -hmm. keep your equipment up on top so it doesn't rut in. You can at least in some wet falls get to your crop and some other guys can't. Yeah. yeah. So no, I mean, especially on heavier soil. Yeah. So on heavier soils, you know, what that's a total loss if you can't harvest. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so for the, us and the reason why I'm asking about profitability is because look, you guys are doing great stuff. I mean, it, that's exactly what we need to do to improve water quality. And you're going to hear about this others on Thursday. We need a million acres of cover crops to get to meet our water quality goals in Unlake Pete and Law. So if, if we can show if you can show that it's profitable mm -hmm. or it increases your profit per acre or maybe you know it just increases your profit per acre not necessarily yield but your profit that because that considers all the running back and forth on your with your equipment your time everything else and the use of uh, more efficient use of your manure right exactly. it's a win-win it's a win-win no exactly and actually um that's a good point scott because um it was a, a couple weeks ago now but uh, I, I did a talk for the Farm Profitability Expo. And so it was a similar slideshow, but geared towards specifically towards profitability. So I had a few more points in there that off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, but I had quite a few, you know, decent things in there. And so, yeah, I, cause I know that's important to people. And if you, um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. If you don't, if it's not economical, no farmer's going to do it. And I can honestly say, that we would never go back. I mean, it's, it's, it's too worthwhile and too, too useful for us to, to just to want to stop As, especially, you know, obviously cover crops, you have that seed cost, but it's still so valuable, but especially no till, I mean, to, to, to go back and. Dave, what you just said is huge. That that's huge that you, you guys wouldn't go back because he did. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of risky because your profit margin isn't great to begin with. And it's kind of risky to try something new, but when you try to get now, if you could just get other farmers to do it and that's where we're, we're going to rely on folks like you and, mm -hmm. and Epic to, you know, spread that word. Another one, Scott too, actually is um chemical cost. You know, you're, you're we, we still definitely use chemical and, and we will have to for, I'm sure a while, uh, you know, that's something that's going to be really hard to try to fully get away from, but um, definitely, uh, you know, using less chemical because you have the cover crops for weed suppression and also like I talked about the bugs and whatnot. Uh, so that was important and that's a cost savings. So, and a lot of what you're doing right now could be, we could use that over here in the central sands area where it's mostly vegetable, potato and vegetable growing, mm -hmm. you know, understand certain crops they can't because they can't, uh, like snap beans or peas, they can't have that trash in there yeah. from, from the cover crust. But there's no absolutely no reason why you couldn't do it for sweet corn or potatoes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, or sugar beets or carrots. Yeah. So, no, that's a great point. I don't think, you know, that's not my realm. So I don't think much about that or what that looks like. But yeah, I, I think getting, getting all of them. Maybe it should be your realm. Maybe you should start growing <laughs> veggies over here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> One last question for you. How old are you? I'm 28. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to 
say, David, the one uh, fact that you brought up that I think stuck with me the most was that in 60 years, we could lose, um, we could have unproductive soils. I mean, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I hope you get that word out to any farmer you meet because that's huge. If we don't have soils, we're into the dust bowl again. Right. And actually another good point to that, that I'd heard on a, a podcast was, um, was that there's companies like Nestle and a few other really big food companies that are starting to look into if they aren't already doing this is actually paying their suppliers a bit more to, to do these practices. And it wasn't consumer driven. It was driven by the fact that this is their whole world is selling food. So if there's no food to sell, they're bankrupt. And so I, I just, I couldn't believe that, but that was their driver. It was not even consumer driven, which is most of changes in the marketplace. It was what happens when we can't grow food in 60 years? What am I as Nestle? What am I buying? I'm, I can't buy anything. I'm going broke. So I just, that was powerful to me when I heard that. So, yeah. So. Yeah. That's here, Dave. Um, I have a question in regard to uh, both no-till and cover crops. Um, are you uh, familiar with any producer-led groups uh, down here in the sand country uh, that uh, expose or, or expound uh, the uh, goodness of uh, these two uh, 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 situations? Uh, we're in the process of uh, helping to uh, uh, better the quality of our water here in the watershed. And uh, Scott had mentioned both the uh, vegetable growers and uh, the potato people. Um, again, uh, is it a, a situation where uh, we know of a, a number of producer-led councils up in the heavy soil country? Mm -hmm. uh, our soil is very, very different here. Um, any comments on that? Um, that's a good point. I, I'm not entirely sure about different groups in that area, but just one thing I will say about that is, I think, I think cover crops no-till are a solution to two types of problem. And for us with the heavy soils, it's phosphorus and phosphorus runoff. And for you guys with the light soils, it's nitrate see, you know, seeping through and into the groundwater and all that stuff. And so I, I think for us, protecting the soils, utilizing that phosphorus, but for you, protecting the soils and capturing and utilizing that, that nitrogen that's used you know, for, with the cover crops, I think that's really important. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. It looks like someone just. Um, no, maybe yeah, not. that was Scott. Yeah. Um, and yes, uh, to answer your question, I test water here in our, our watershed mm -hmm. and the nitrates are definitely the highest on our list as far as uh, something to ameliorate. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And one more question. Uh, do you do any irrigation? We do not. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Thank you. I had a quick question. Uh, so I loved your analogy of comparing soil microbiome to kind of the stomach microbiome. Um, you know, both concepts are really, really new uh, to, to science. You know, there's not a whole lot we understand in either realm, um, but it's becoming more and more popular. And we're realizing that, you know, bacteria really are what kind of govern a lot of our natural systems. Um, so I'm wondering when, when did you uh, really start incorporating that that concept of the soil microbiome into your management strategy? Um, I'd say that has been more along in the last year or two um, because we've kind of learned more. And, and uh, the thing I talked about, the potash, um, we learned that just a few months ago. So not to say that that's 100% accurate, but it, it makes sense that, again, I think, I think potash is a lot of chlor chloride or something. And so that kind of burns and kills off that, that microbiome, which, again, potentially... Um, could be the reason why for us, we, we just, it seems like we're always low in potassium in our soils. And so it seems like we have to put on more and more potash. Well, is there something else there? Like, why is this? Um, so yeah, potassium chloride. Yep. So, uh, so yeah, so that's just something, there's another type of potassium you can put on, but it's very expensive. Um, so we might experiment with a small amount of it on a small field, but yeah, so that's, that's interesting. So, and the other just kind of the random fact for everyone is, is it's, it seems like the microbiome in humans in the gut is a huge proponent of like mental health and ha having, you know, issues in that realm of, of that really can hurt you there. So it's, it's a big deal. So, 
I'd like to think that a healthy soil microbiome, which is where we, our food comes from, can potentially, uh, you know, string down to the next, the next species that eats in the next, and you know, all that. So kind of affecting everything in a big circle, you could say. Actually, um, just so you know, David, my son is totally into nutrition. Mm -hmm. And he completely convinced his old parents to eat organic and grass fed. Yeah. And the reason is because there's more nutrients, not as much as there should be because, you know, in the United States, we've kind of ruined our crop fields, but there's more nutrients than in regular processed foods. So mm -hmm. that completely makes sense. And also it's the immune system. The stomach is the immune system in a human. Yeah, so it right. keeps you, yeah, from getting diseases like, you know, getting sick and all. Mm -hmm. it's, all it's all tied in. Crazy to think those tiny little soldiers can do so much. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions for David? Yes. Um, David, I'm just really impressed with all the changes that you've made to incorporate all these practices in your farm. What was the driving factor behind it that really got you started to begin with? Oh, that's a good question. It, it was, I'd have to say it was some of the water issues that we were seeing in Wisconsin. Cause again, this, so, so I've been, you know, this is my family farm and I've been full time on the farm since uh, January of 2016. And we had started this a few years prior to that. And so partially speaking for my uncle, but basically I think the big thing was um, just wanting to, again, again, improve, improve um, water quality in Wisconsin. Cause I know it's, it's been an issue for quite a while and I, I can't, I guess maybe you guys would know better than me of when we kind of started to, to um, talk about this, like water, water in Wisconsin, if it's been maybe going on now for a decade or so. And so I think that was kind of a big part of why Tom really wanted to dig into it and say, Hey, what, what, what can we do as a farm to, to help this? So. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. You've done a lot. Thank you. David, that was great. I, I just wanted to I'll build on something you said when you talked about the companies who uh, buy the products for manufacture or distribution to the public. It reminded me of something I read about General Mills just a few weeks ago. And uh, they have um, on their corporate website, they've indicated that their key suppliers uh, must now be sus use sustainable farming practices in order to do business with them. And that's exactly the point you raised is that when the demand comes from those who buy the eventual end product, uh, I think that's when we see improvement. So there's another example. Yeah. So uh, great story. And um, you're one heck of a storyteller, David. Uh, it's um, really, this was so interesting. I, I just, um, you know, it's like we could talk for hours about this. I think there are so many questions. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll hear from you again. Oh, and, we're gonna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll drag you back into this. Um, I wanted to ask a question of you, David. I wondered, um, so much of the material you talked about is, um, it, it's it's new to us, uh, some as a refresher. Uh, it would be so great to have an outline of what you talked about. And I wondered if you might have something like that you could share with us, some information that relates to that which you talked about today. Well, I mean, I'd be, I'd be fine sharing my slide deck if that's kind of what you're thinking. Sure, that'd be that'd be great if you yeah. do that, and mm -hmm. uh, it might bring up more questions than it answers. But uh, that's the beauty of all of this is, uh, you know, how much we've learned from people like you. So thank you. Did you put that slide show on a P as a PDF on your website. Yeah, um, are you asking me or David? Yeah, yeah I'm asking 14 Mile if they, uh, obviously if David approves. Yes, no, that'd be fine. Yep, that I, that'd be fine if you wanted to do that. Yeah. I can, uh, I can uh, send it to you, Don, um, okay. in an email.